Senate Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the morning roll call of the Senate be made the Senate roll call of the joint session. If there is no objection, the morning roll call of the Senate will be made the Senate roll call for the joint session. House Majority Leader Duran. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, I move that the morning roll call of the House be made the House roll call of the joint session. If there is no objection, the morning roll call of the House will be made the House roll call for the joint session. A quorum is present. As is customary, it is my privilege and honor to present the gavel to the President of the Senate and ask that he preside over these proceedings. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will the Joint Committee composed of Senators Buckner and Kirkmeyer and Representatives Titone, Dixon, and Lynch escort the governor into the House chamber? It is my pleasure and honor to present to you the Honorable Jared Polis, Governor of the State of Colorado. I'll use it, why not? I'll just be sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see if it's easy to all use it. It is. So actually, I won't, let's take it out. Because the, the, those are set at a different level. All right. Speaker McCluskey, President Fenberg, Majority Leader Duran, Majority Leader Moreno, members of the General Assembly of Colorado, which, for the first time in history, is a majority of women. And, and that's, by the way, that's the first time in history, not the last time in history. Lieutenant Governor Diane Primavera, Treasurer Young, Attorney General Weiser, Secretary of State Griswold, First Gentleman Marlon Reese, members of the State Board of Education, Justices of the Colorado Supreme Court, members of the Cabinet, and members of the Colorado Delegation to the 118th Congress of the United States. Welcome. Today, our administration is standing in the threshold between the last four years and the four years to come. We're middle-aged, but God willing, our midlife crisis is past. Uh, I have a bit less hair than four years ago, but hopefully more wisdom and experience. We've gone through a lot these last four years. COVID-19, shootings, devastating wildfires, record inflation, spiraling hate speech. But Colorado should know that no matter what comes our way, I'll continue to fight every day to protect our state. Colorado is unique. We always have been. We're a state that just this year voted to cut the income tax again and legalize mushrooms. Our state might be shaped like a square, but the political pundits can never put us in a box. They often label us whatever color they see, red, blue, purple. Well, not so much red lately, but, you know, I see a harmonious rainbow of colorful opinions that make up our state of pragmatic Westerners. 
So as we start this new session, let's not forget who we are. Let's not get lost in zero-sum politics, and let's focus on working together for real results. We've seen the consequences of divisiveness and what happens when we retreat into stylos and stop having productive conversations, and that's not who we are as a state and as a people. With extreme partisanship grinding progress to a halt in Washington, it's more important than ever for us to lead the Colorado way. That means showing up and coming together when duty calls. We dig in, we work through our differences, we get on uh, to work on the thorny issues together, and we move forward, making important decisions, compromises in pursuit of real results and the best outcomes that improve our lives. None of us in this chamber are here because it's easy. We're here because we believe in this work. We believe in a better tomorrow for our children, a Colorado for all. And, it, and as I stand before you today, I'm recommitting myself and my administration to bold ideas that move Colorado forward, to take on our greatest challenges with determination, with optimism, and including the voice of all Coloradans. Together, we'll build on our success from these last four years. We aren't for one moment resting on them. Like the Nuggets, Nikola Jokic, who won back-to-back -back MVP awards but continues to fight for that championship alongside his teammates on the Nuggets. Or like Gandalf the Grey from the Lord of the Rings who fought the Balrog through Moria's underworld, helping Frodo escape and then returned as Gandalf the White to help defeat Sauron's army and give Frodo the chance to destroy the ring. And like Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who created the hit show South Park, and then one of the most successful Broadway musicals, and now they're tackling their greatest challenge of all, Casa Bonita. Which we're thrilled, by the way, will be opening this May. I got a sneak peek, you all are gonna love it. But what do these folks have in common? Um, Jokic, Gandalf, Trey and Matt, I don't think they've ever been mentioned before in the same paragraph. But Jokic, Gandalf, Trey and Matt, and Colorado all believe that our next chapter is our best chapter, and I do too. Colorado's best days are still to come. Three, three years from now, three years from now, three and a half, in 2026, we will proudly celebrate our Centennial State's 150th birthday. And the United States of America will celebrate our 250th birthday. The words we need to learn, by the way, are sesquicentennial for Colorado and semi-quincentennial for America. Thanks to Senator Zenzinger and Representative Catlin, who shepherded through the legislation to create the America 250, Colorado 150 Commission, ensuring that we truly make this a celebration for the ages, honoring our past, present, and future. But really, it's all of us who will decide what we're celebrating, because we are the living heritage of our state, and together, we are the architects of our future. As we prepare to mark this historic milestone, we must ask ourselves, how can we learn to correctly pronounce sesquicentennial and semi-quincentennial? Just kidding. Well, we do need to do that. But we should ask ourselves, who do we as Coloradans want to be in our 150th year? How can our work now and over the next couple of years make that Colorado possible? And finally, how can Colorado's example shine a bright light for the nation? In Colorado, we've already taken action to protect our freedoms, and we have protected a woman's right to choose. We've, we've built a world 
class voting system to ensure that every Coloradan can have their voice heard through our election process. And joining us today is Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, a champion for voting rights and access. We also fight for every person's right to be who they are and love who they love. We believe, we believe in freedom of the press and freedom of speech, and we defend everyone's right to live their lives in our state with dignity and respect. In Colorado, we lead by example, enshrining these values in what we say and what we do. And by the time America is 250, we hope for a country that also respects freedom, the personal health decisions of women and transgender Americans and all Americans, and we want secure, accessible elections for every voter in our country, not just Colorado voters. And of course, we must secure our borders and fix our inhumane, broken immigration system. People have always come to America, as my own great-grandparents did, in search of freedom, safety, economic opportunity, often escaping brutal oppression from authoritarian communist dictators like Maduro and Venezuela. But we as a country haven't always lived up to those values. We're doing our part in Colorado to support migrants and a special thanks to the city of Denver, Larimer County, and many nonprofits including Papagayo, Vive Wellness, and the American Friends Service Committee for being great partners in making sure that everyone who comes to or through our state is treated in the most humane way possible. Some of these service organizations are here with us today. Please join me in thanking them. But we don't want to waste this opportunity with our members of Congress here. We need our federal government to act. Uh, the time is now, and we are proud to be joined by Representative Goose, Representative Crow, as well as our two newest representatives, Representative Pedersen and Representative Caraveo. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to both of you. Colorado can help shape our country's quest to become a more perfect union by setting a bold pace of progress, fighting for liberty, and delivering on our promises to improve the quality of life. So when Colorado is 150 years old, who do we want to be? I'm sure many of us have been asked that dreaded question, where do you see yourself in five years? You know, I often ask that when I'm interviewing people for jobs. Uh, it can be a tough question. But when it comes to the future of our state, it's also a powerful, powerful question that we should ask ourselves. Let's start with housing. Many Coloradans are struggling to find a place where they can afford to live. Many more are being forced out of their neighborhoods with no hope of ever living close to where they work. That means more traffic, lost time and money spent on long commutes, more air pollution, and greater economic and workforce challenges. This is far beyond just a local problem, since issues like transportation and water and energy and more inherently cross jurisdictional boundaries, it becomes a statewide problem that truly impacts all of us. And we need an approach that creates more housing now, protects Colorado resources, and reduces sprawl. It's clear that actions of just one jurisdiction impact others, especially when it comes to housing, our environment, transportation systems, roads and transit, water, sewer infrastructure, indeed, our economic prosperity and growth. Frankly, Coloradans see it that way, too, that way too, and we are here today to provide some relief. The people of Colorado expect us to deliver on making housing more affordable.
And if we don't act now, we will soon face a spiraling point of no return. Just look west. In California, decades of poor planning has led to interruptions of drinking water and electricity for entire towns and cities. Average home prices, over a million dollars in major cities, and 16 lane freeways. I had to look this up, I didn't believe it. Yes, 16 lane freeways with bumper to bumper traffic. We are not California, we are Colorado. When Colorado is 150 years old, we need our state to have more housing for every Colorado budget close to where jobs are. You know, the, you know, the last time Colorado made major land use changes was in 1974, before I and most of you were born. We were a different state then. Over the last half century, there's a few people giggling because they were born before 1974, but I did look it up. The majority of you were born uh, <laughs> after 1974. Um, over the last half century, housing prices have increased roughly four times the rate of income. That means that a house today costs over four times as much compared to today's in income levels than 60 years ago. That puts the dream of home ownership out of range for more and more Coloradans. And this has got to stop. We need to bring our land use policy into the 21st century and prepare ourselves for success these next 150 years. We need more housing now. These, by the way, these aren't new ideas. In fact, the good book offers similar urban planning advice in Isaiah 54, verses two and three. Make your tent bigger, stretch them out and make them wider. Do not hold back. Make the ropes longer and stakes stronger because you will spread out to the left and to the right and your children will live again in cities that were once abandoned. Isaiah 54, verses two and three. Let us heed the words of Isaiah in our time. It's time to legalize more housing choices for every Coloradan and give homeowners more freedom, revitalize our cities and towns, and protect the character of our state, our open space, and our wild areas. Together, we can truly get this done. We can be a place where people can live where they wanna live, close to their jobs, close to their kids' schools, with efficient, low-cost transit. We can save Coloradans money on housing, and that will help us achieve our climate and air quality goals. Building smart, efficient housing, especially in and near urban communities and job centers, won't just reduce costs. It'll save energy, conserve our water, and protect the lands and wildlife that are so important to our Colorado way of life. It'll also support an exciting vision for public transit options to create low-cost ways to travel. They give Coloradans more choices and leads to more breathable air and less traffic for all of us. Together, we've laid the foundation for a statewide road and transit system that meets the needs of Coloradans with the historic investments from Senate Bill 260 and then with the creation of the Front Range Rail District scheduled to deliver a draft service plan in 2024. Thank you to President Fenberg, Senator Winter, and Senator Zenzinger for your leadership on those bills. Over the next few years, we'll continue working towards that vision, and I'm asking the Colorado Department of Transportation to work with local transit partners to identify and take the next steps towards better, low-cost transit options. More housing now, is for people, for the planet, and for prosperity. It's for people who need a roof over their head, who need that security, who want to recognize a dream of home ownership and wealth building. It's for the planet to reduce our emissions and save water. And it's for our prosperity as a state to ensure that businesses can hire people to power our economy forward. Let me be clear, housing policy is climate policy. Housing policy is transportation policy. 
Housing policy is economic policy. Housing policy is water policy. And housing pol policy is public health and equity policy. It impacts every part of our lives, and it's critical we get this right, and we need everyone to come to the table to work towards a real solution. Now, I know it won't be easy. As I like to say, if it was easy, it would have been done already. This is work that remains to be done. But in Colorado, we don't shy away from tough challenges. We roll up our sleeves, and we get to work. Since 2019, we've invested billions of dollars in housing. We've created the first ever dedicated funding source for affordable housing, and out of American Rescue Plan Act dollars, thank you, members of Congress, uh, we uh, applied it towards projects around the state of Colorado. And now voters have passed Proposition 123, dedicating hundreds of millions of dollars more in the coming years. But we can't just buy our way out of this. We have to break down government barriers, expand private property rights, and reduce regulations to actually construct more housing, to provide housing options at a lower cost so that all Coloradans can thrive. And we took a first step to break down those barriers and support local innovation with House Bill 27, 1271. And I want to thank Speaker McCluskey, Representative Judah, and Senator Gonzalez for their important work on that bill, 1271. One of the grants from that bill went to support the city of Greeley, which utilized funding to encourage different kinds of housing, including homes with a smaller footprint, options for accessory dwelling units, manufactured homes, micro homes, and more. They're also creating more home ownership opportunities in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. Today we're joined by Greeley City Manager Raymond Lee and his team. Thank you for your work. And by the way, Greeley's growing fast. Uh, they're coming for you, Mayor Coffin and Mayor Southers. They're, uh, We're seeing this kind of local innovation and leadership in many parts of our state as well. Uh, Summit County and the town of Breckenridge are building a new 52-unit workforce apartment complex near downtown Breckenridge to make it easier for workers to find a place to live in their own community. And projects like this often take 18 to 24 months just to get approved, but thanks to Summit County donating to the land and the leadership of local officials, uh, this one got the green light after just six months leading to 52 new homes, years ahead of schedule, with millions of dollars in savings. From Breckenridge, we're joined by Mayor Eric Mamula, members of the Town Council, and Senior Planner Lori Best from Summit County. We're joined by Commissioner uh, Tamara Pogue, Elizabeth Lawrence, and Joshua Blanchard, and Housing Director Jason Dietz. Please join me and welcome them here all today. Thank you for your will to help us solve this critical issue for your county and an issue and a challenge that we share in many other parts of the state. But the innovations and savings don't end there. Because Summit County partnered with a modular home company called Fading West out of Buena Vista, they're saving roughly 20% on construction costs and saving months of construction time, especially during the winter season. If you can believe it, Fading West can build a home in about 18 working days compared to close to a year for a traditionally built home. I had the chance to visit their factory in November, and it's exciting to see this innovation at work. Today, we're joined by Fading West CEO, Charlie Chupp, and Vice President of Sales and Strategic Partnerships, Eric Schaefer. They, They and other modular home and prefabricated home companies are innovating to build more housing opportunities quicker and at a lower cost to help more Coloradans have security in their home. And we're excited to have them join us today. But listen, the reality is that projects like these are often the exception in our state, not the rule. 
The more common scenario, we've all heard this many times, is when housing projects are rejected or mired in years of red tape, adding costs and time. And I'm here asking you to help protect the Colorado we love so Coloradans can stay in our communities, live near where they work, protect our open space, reduce traffic. Let's make sure that Colorado stays Colorado. And that means we need more flexible zoning to allow more housing, streamlined regulations that cut through red tape, expedited approval process for projects like modular housing, sustainable development, building in transit-oriented communities that in and of itself empower the ability to deliver more transit at a low cost. And of course, we also recognize that the state itself should be a contributing partner in this work. So we are aggressively making parcels of state-owned land available for housing in all parts of the state. One, one example is Dow Junction in Vail Valley, where we're planning to build 80 units of workforce housing on state land. And my budget includes funding for other government and public landowners, including counties, school districts, cities, transportation districts, to proactively partner with the private sector to build more housing. And I call on all of these public landowners to join our efforts in being part of the solution. We also want to continue our work to reduce property taxes for Coloradans. Last year, thanks to your work, we saved Coloradans more than $700 million through historic property tax relief for homeowners and businesses while protecting funding for our schools, thanks to the work of Senator Hansen and Representative Weissman. But residential values grew more than 26% over the last two years much more than most people's incomes grew during that same period. And if we don't act, property taxes will go up by hundreds, even thousands of dollars at a rate faster than people's incomes. The good news is uh, Colorado's a great place to live. The bad news is the secret's out, and that's driven up home prices. Uh, we must work together to pass a long-term property tax relief package that reduces residential and commercial property tax rates and creates a long-term mechanism to protect homeowners from being priced out of their homes while protecting school funding. This will make Colorado more competitive and, yes, more affordable to live. I'm proud that this year, Colorado is the first state in the country where every homeowner can defer paying some of the increase in their property taxes until their property is sold. No one should lose their home simply because its value and the property taxes have gone up. I want to thank Colorado's treasurer, Dave Young, for his tireless work to help property owners, and I look forward to finding opportunities to extend deferrals to save people money on property taxes. Treasurer Young. We should also make the senior homestead tax exemption portable. Our seniors should be able to downsize without having to pay higher property taxes, freeing up their larger old homes for young, growing families. It just makes sense. And, you know, a more just tax system that promotes prosperity for all is a passion that I think we all share in this chamber. While we don't always agree, on the path, I know all of us want to save Coloradans money. It's no secret that I and most economists despise the income tax. I was proud to have supported two successful income tax cuts at the ballot box, and since I took office, our income tax rate has gone from 4.63% to 4.44%, helping produce strong economic growth and low unemployment. We've worked together to close special interest tax loopholes to pay for that income tax cut and provide even greater relief to Colorado families, seniors, and small businesses. Last year, we also worked together to send every tax filer $750 nearly a year ahead of schedule, providing real inflation relief just when people needed it the most. Together, 
of course, we need to do more. Now, I don't expect that we can fully eliminate the income tax by our 150th anniversary. But let's continue to make progress. With healthy budget surpluses from our strong economy, we should further reduce the income tax rate for everyone, while doubling down on relief for working families with policies like expanding the earned income tax credit. We have the tools to save people money. Let's get it done. <laughs> Making our state more affordable and creating more housing now is also one of the most effective ways to reduce homelessness in our state. We continue uh, seeking proposals from local governments to utilize the $200 million that this legislature invested last year to reduce homelessness. Thanks to Representative Rod Woodrow, Representative Valdez, Senator Gonzalez, Senator Hansen, uh, Senator Fields, and Senator Coleman for your work securing this transformative funding. Once again, thanks to our federal delegation for American Rescue Act. There are many creative approaches that have worked in other states, even in parts of our own state, and we hope to see those proven data-driven models replicated here to reduce homelessness. This is going to be a lot of work, and it's going to take all of us in this chamber and our partners in local government to get this done. We're here to solve the big problems, and of course, uh, the cost of housing tops that list for so many Coloradans. That's what Coloradans are calling for, and it's up to us to take action to protect our shared future as a state. Just as the future of our state uh, is tied to housing, it's also tied to water. Water is life in Colorado and the West. It's as simple as that. And we're at a crossroads. Increased demand, chronic and extreme drought, conflicts with other states, and devastating climate events are threatening this critical infrastructure. And we're already seeing the impacts. Wildfires have destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres and devastated entire communities. Farmers and ranchers across the state fear that Colorado won't have the water to sustain the next generation of agricultural jobs. When Colorado's 150, I want our state to have the water resources for our farms, community, and industries to thrive, and the tools in place to protect our state's waterways and defend our rights. Your work on housing will truly go a long way to protect water, our most precious resource, but we also need to continue investing in water projects across the state. We don't want to see a single dollar left at the table. For every dollar the state invested in water plan grants last year, we bought $4 back. In the last fiscal year, we awarded more than $23 million in grants that supported about $100 million in projects. And we're hoping to position Colorado to punch above our weight and pull down major investments from the federal government around needed water infrastructure. That includes funding for water quality projects like the Arkansas Valley Conduit. This project had been years in the making, and the combination of state and federal funding is helping to get it off the ground, delivering clean drinking water to dozens of communities throughout southern Colorado. These dollars also translate to restoration of critical streams and waterways, greater access to water for our farmers and ranchers, and water security for growing communities. But the most important thing we can do for water security is protect our waterways and rights. Hotter, drier conditions have strained our resources at a time when demand continues to grow. Our rivers and streams aren't just life sources for Colorado, but for the entire American West. We must continue to fight for our rights and lead the way to a sustainable future. The road ahead will be paved with challenges, but we aren't leaving anything to chance. We are gearing up and bringing in the expertise we need to defend what is ours. This is about water, but it's also about our future, our livelihoods, and the very foundation of what we need for our success as Coloradans. The same goes for our approach on climate action and clean air. We've already secured more than 80% renewable energy by 2030. By the time Colorado is 150 years old, we look forward to having a clear path 
to 100% renewable energy by 2040. And we will get it done. We will also work on making progress towards our statewide climate goals. Our work around housing, once again, and more sustainable development is a key part of this progress on climate. But we also remain focused on investing in clean transportation, accelerating the use of renewables, reducing oil and gas emissions, and holding polluters accountable. We are proud to put forward a $120 million annual new clean energy tax credit package. With this tax relief and incentives, we can improve our air quality, accelerate innovation, and make more rapid progress toward our goals while saving people money at the pump on their utility bills and increasing access to clean, low-cost transportation options. We're making a lot of progress on electric vehicles with about 10% of vehicles sold now electric. That ranks us fifth in the nation. And these tax credits will help us continue pushing towards more zero emission cars and trucks sooner rather than later in the state of Colorado. <laughs> this builds on the work that the legislature did to expand the earned income tax credit and Colorado child tax credit, putting more money back in the pocket of Coloradans. Thank you, Representative Sirota, Representative Weissman, Senator Hansen, Majority Leader Moreno, for bringing those bills across the finish line. We're also focused on the continued development of clean energy technologies of the future, including geothermal and hydrogen. As chair of the Bipartisan Western Governors Association, I'm championing geothermal energy through our Heat Beneath Our Feet initiative. And I'm excited that my budget request provides funding for Colorado Mesa University to expand campus-wide geothermal heating and cooling systems to help them achieve their goal of becoming the first university in America fully powered by geothermal heating and cooling. <laughs> President, President Marshall, who's with us, ran the numbers and tells us that they're about 70% uh, heating and cooling through geothermal now, it actually translates directly into about a 2% lower tuition for their students with the money that would have gone to utility bills and heating costs. <laughs> and under the leadership of the unbreakable Will Tour, Our energy office is leading the way with a multi-state consortium with Utah, Wyoming, and New Mexico to gain additional federal investment as a hydrogen hub. Thanks again to the members of our federal delegation, and we look forward to your help in securing the selection of our four states as a hydrogen hub. These efforts will help us capitalize on these untapped resources, close the 20% gap, to truly achieve 100% renewable energy by 2040, reduce emissions, clean our air, and do our part on climate. This will also help us prevent the kind of spikes in utility bills that Coloradans are experiencing due to the high costs of natural gas. The Texas storm in 2021 showed us just how vulnerable we are to commodity price swings, and the Suncor shutdown is showing us the same. I'm committed to doing everything in my power to alleviate the impacts of the temporary Suncor disaster on Coloradans and their families who are already struggling with inflation and high costs. I've already lifted regulatory uh, burdens around trucking hours, truck wait times, limits, and directed agencies to ease up on pipeline transportation requirements during the Suncor shutdown. My administration has also been working to secure outside supply to minimize disruption. But the only long-term solution is to continue pursuing low-cost, reliable, renewable energy for the state of Colorado. We simply must 
end our reliance on fossil fuels, improve energy security, and save people money. That's why the electric vehicle and e-bike tax credits I'm proposing are so important and why we're focused on increasing access to electric vehicles and transit options since we took office. This tax relief amplifies the work of the Front Range Rail District, free bus fare months, and the need for greater transit options. I look forward to working with the General Assembly to make Colorado a place where geothermal, hydrogen, and carbon capture technologies can and will succeed. While we do our part to improve our air quality and reduce pollution, we're also preparing our state for the hotter, drier climate that we're experiencing. Since 2019, Colorado has supported response efforts for more than 2,000 wildfires, including the three largest in the history of Colorado and the most destructive in the history of Colorado. It was only a few weeks ago that we marked the one-year anniversary of the Marshall Fire in Boulder County, a reminder that the threat of wildfire is no longer seasonal. It's year-round, and we need to be more ready than ever before. Colorado has invested in some of the most effective fire prevention and response measures out there, from our state's first Firehawk helicopter to forest restoration and proven mitigation efforts. I want to thank President Fenberg and the Joint Budget Committee for leading the way for these important resources for firefighting. But we know there's more work ahead. We need to continue strengthening our aerial capabilities, supporting our professional and volunteer firefighters, and preparing for a hotter, drier climate. We must also expand fire prevention efforts, including building fire defense around communities that are at risk, elevating the work of the Colorado Strategic Wildfire Action Program. Getting this right is critical for the health of our communities and for the future of our state. But, you know, it's not just about the health of our environment, it's also about the health of our people. Unfortunately, after housing expenses, health care costs are often the highest costs that families face. Too many Coloradans continue to have to choose between the care they need or paying their rent or mortgage or putting food on their family's table. Our own Lieutenant Governor, Dan Primavera, knows this story all too well. Diane was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she was told she had five years to live. With two young daughters to raise, her life was turned upside down, and she was forced to wrestle with a question that too many of our fellow Coloradans have faced. Can I support my family and pay for treatments? Will this devastate us financially? Will I be able to be there for our children? Well, I'm proud to say Diane hasn't just survived, she's thrived. She's dedicated her career in public service as a legislator in state government, and of course, as Lieutenant Governor of Colorado and the head of our Office of Saving People, Money, and Healthcare, please join me in recognizing our Lieutenant Governor, the best Lieutenant Governor in the country, <laughs> Diane Primavera! <laughs> with her grandson. And her grandson is extremely well behaved, I must add. We didn't bring our kids because they, uh, one of them is, she pointed out. Um, together we've educated costs, uh, we've reduced costs for healthcare uh, coverage through the bipartisan reinsurance program, the Colorado Option, OmniSalud, expanded Medicaid, expanded CHIP. Just last week, uh, we learned that more than 34,000 people in our state have enrolled in Colorado option plans, saving Coloradans millions of dollars and surpassing the original enrollment uh, uh, goals. Thank you for your work around the Colorado option. We've saved people money by capping insulin costs, by passing farmer rebates onto consumers, by increasing hospital pricing transparency. We've also taken the first steps to fix our behavioral health system with the creation of the Behavioral Health Administration and the investment of American Rescue Plan Act funding. But we know that we have a lot more work to do. The United States spends far more on health care, nearly twice as much as our peers around the world, and yet our results are no better. 
Meanwhile, Coloradans still pay some of the highest costs for health care, particularly hospital care in the country. Sadly, we're among the top 10 states for hospital costs, price, and profit. And Colorado likes to be in the top, but not on highest costs. Our work to save people money on health care is more urgent than ever before, and we must leave no stone unturned. When we turn 150 years old, I want Colorado to be a state where everyone can get the care they need easily and affordably. First, we have to continue saving people money on prescriptions. Prescription drug costs take up too much of someone's personal monthly expenses with costs rising faster than inflation. In 2021, about 10% of Coloradans were unable to fill his prescription because of costs, leading to bad health outcomes, but also higher costs, as it often led to the need for urgent hospital care. With us today is Carissa, a type 1 diabetic. Thanks to our work to cap insulin costs, the first legislation of its kind in the country, she no longer has to choose between buying groceries and the insulin that she needs to stay healthy. She described that bill as saving her life, and we're so grateful to have her here. Join me in welcoming Carissa. Carissa is far from alone. Because of that legislation, every diabetic in Colorado can get their insulin at an affordable price. And I know this is personal to many of you, and I want to thank Senator Roberts and Senator Priola for your important work in making this a reality. And there's more that we can and must do. By saving people money on prescriptions, we can prevent the rationing of medication that leads to worse health outcomes and higher health care costs. That's why, in addition to our efforts to lower, uh, import lower cost drugs from Canada, uh, we'll be working to build on the work of Senator Gonzalez, Senator Jaquez Lewis, and Representative Kennedy to strengthen the Prescription Drug Affordability Board so we can continue making progress to save people money on life-saving medications. Like, like your prescription drug rebate legislation last year, we'll also continue to hold middlemen accountable for cutting the cost of prescription drugs so employers can pass along savings to consumers and reduce premiums. But that's just one piece of the puzzle. We've worked with the healthcare industry in good faith to lower costs, but not all of them have held up their end of the bargain. Some health insurers continue to profit from Coloradans while administrative costs unrelated to patient care continue soaring. Insurers need to step up to reduce costs and improve outcomes in the state of Colorado. <laughs> similarly, similarly, some large hospital systems are making record profits, paying zero taxes, and sitting on enormous reserves derived from overcharging customers. Meanwhile, they're consolidating providers, which drives up cost and leaves fewer options for our fellow Coloradans. It's time that we hold them accountable. First and foremost, that means stop overcharging patients. It also means that nonprofit hospitals who have the benefit of not having to pay taxes must work with their communities to live up to the promise that providing community benefits like mental health, maternity care, health care workforce growth, support for social determinants of health like housing and food occur. We should build on the work of Representative Kennedy and Senator Winter, their great work um, in tracking these resources and ensuring that nonprofit hospitals actually use community benefit dollars for community benefit. We can and we should support the great work of the bipartisan reinsurance program created by Speaker McCluskey, Senator Rich, to deliver even more savings to consumers through lower insurance premiums for people on the exchange. After healthcare and housing, 
Education is another big cost for many Coloradans. Access to a quality education is fundamental. It's a right. It's critical for our state's ongoing prosperity in the next 150 years. At 150, I want to see an education system that prepares every child and learners of all ages for success in our state. And that starts with early childhood education. Early childhood education, thanks to Representative McLaughlin, Senator Bridges, and Senator Fields, free full day kindergarten saves families thousands of dollars every year. And thanks to Representative Sirota, Senator Buckner, President Fenberg, so many others, and of course, the people of Colorado. Free preschool launching this fall will save families at least $6,000 a year and give every child the best possible start in life. This is a monumental achievement. And today, by the way, is the very first day that families can apply to enroll their three-year-olds, four-year-olds next year in preschool. And I'm excited to share that more than 4,300 families have already started applying in the last few hours alone. Today, we're joined by Shar Portillo, a teacher at Strasburg Elementary, and her three children, Elias, a kindergarten ethren, and a future preschooler, Tyler, who will start preschool this fall, earlier today. Their family filled out Tyler's preschool application, making them among some of the very first to sign up. Thank you, Shar Elias, Aaron, and Tyler for being with us here today. There they are. And to the rest of you, uh, tell your friends with three-year-olds that they can go to upk.colorado.gov and sign up. I'll take a moment so you can all text your friends with three-year-olds. That's upk.colorado.gov. Time to sign up. And of course, share that with your lists, your social media, uh, and everybody you know so that Coloradans can take advantage of this important benefit for themselves, their family budget, and of course, to prepare their kids for success. Um, and we want more families like the Portillos to have even more hours of free preschool. And I'm calling on the legislature to refer a simple ballot measure that would allow Colorado to utilize excess Prop EE funds for preschool, just as the legislature did on a bipartisan basis for excess marijuana funds in 2015. This would give voters the choice to support more services for more children and help lower income families enroll their child in full day preschool. And for kindergarten through 12th grade learners, I'm proposing in my supplemental and budget amendment package today that we raise per pupil funding by an additional $925 per student, that's about $20,000 per Colorado classroom each year, building on last year's historic raise made possible by Senator Zenzinger, Senator Lundeen, Speaker McCluskey, and Representative McLaughlin. School districts can use these funds to increase pay, like the Lake County School District that just raised teacher pay by 16% in just one year, with a major bump for, for, for their class, for their class staff, including drivers and paraprofessionals and chefs. Or how Colorado's two largest school districts are now starting their teacher salaries at just over $50,000 per year. That would have been unheard of just half a decade or a decade ago. These new funds also support smaller class size. They revive extracurriculars and they fund mental health support for our students who need it. And today, I'm proud to submit a proposal to buy down the budget stabilization factor to its lowest level ever 
and set our state on a path to finally eliminate it altogether during my second term, fulfilling our state's commitment to our schools. You know, these last few years have been tough for K-12 learners and educators, and those challenges are reflected in test scores, particularly math. To help improve achievement, we're proposing new investments in high-quality math curricula and training to ensure that our educators have the support they need to help our students thrive. We're increasing our commitment to high-quality before and after school programming, saving parents thousands of dollars, and helping to boost math achievement. This is a key part of helping students graduate with the skills they need to succeed. Another key component is increasing the number of students who graduate high school with more than just a diploma. In Colorado, roughly 53% of high school graduates earn some college credit in high school, saving them an estimated $53 million in tuition costs each year. But that number can and should be even higher. Let's ensure that every student has access to career-connected learning while they're in high school, and let's reward those schools that are doing more to help students succeed in the workforce and life, whether it's dual and concurrent enrollment programs, career and technical education, work-based learning, apprenticeships, receiving an industry certificate or associate's degree concurrent with a high school diploma. Every high school student in our state should have that opportunity to get ahead. But we don't want that innovation to end at graduation. We want to create more training pathways for Coloradans of all ages to shape their own success. Luke Skywalker wasn't born knowing the ways of the Force. He was trained under the guidance of Jedi Master Yoda. Two available jobs for every unemployed Coloradan we have. That's right. We have two available jobs for every unemployed person in our state, as Yoda says. Now, Colorado might not need more than a small council of Jedis, but there are many other industries where we need lots of talent. And at 150, I want every Coloradan to have access to the skills needed to get a good paying job that supports them and their families and a workforce that meets the needs of our businesses to power our mighty economic engine of growth. This is another reason why our work in housing is so important. Coloradans have to be able to afford to live in our communities where they can earn a good living, and companies need to be able to find the workers they need to thrive. We've already made historic investments in Colorado's workforce. We're creating regional training partnerships, supporting our local workforce centers, increasing disability employment options, and adopting skills-based hiring practices and apprenticeship opportunities. And I want to thank some of the legislators who worked on these critical bills, including Speaker McCluskey, Senator Rich, Senator Lundeen, and Senator Bridges. Thank you for your work. Last year, Last year, we created Care Forward Colorado, which makes it completely free for Colorado students to pursue careers in healthcare at any community or technical college. And guess what? Uh, enrollment and demand increased. But we want to go beyond just healthcare into other areas that we are experiencing shortages. I'm proposing we expand the Care Forward Colorado uh, funding to include free training for in-demand fields in both the public and private sector, including construction, firefighting, law enforcement, nursing, and early childhood education. We also know that the number of Coloradans pursuing post-secondary education or training right out of high school has been declining. To address this challenge, I'm proposing a new scholarship for graduating high school seniors in the class of 2024 to pursue post-secondary education, training, or certifications. Because the reality is that today's economy demands access to quick skill acquisition, whether that's in a one or two or four year degree or professional training or apprenticeship or on the job training to meet the ever changing needs of our economy and support the livelihood of families. 
we're going to jumpstart access to training to help more Coloradans be career ready, earn more, and power our economy. And this work must be done in collaboration with all those involved, from education to labor unions to training providers and the business community. We also want to continue investing in the hardworking state, our hardworking state employees that drive Colorado forward. They plow our interstates on snowy days, they staff our state hospital in Pueblo, they manage our prisons, and much more. Our state workers deserve uh, and respect our respect, fair competitive wages, and of course, good benefits. And I want to thank Colorado Winds for their partnership. Together, together, we've negotiated a compensation package that, if funded by you, will ensure that we can attract and retain the very best talent for the necessary needs of Colorado's state government. And I look forward to working with all of you to support the future of our workforce and economy. And together, we can maybe help more Coloradans not just aspirationally answer the question, where do you see yourself in five years, but actually achieve their career goals. As we think about the future, we also have to think about how we can make Colorado safer and a safer, a safer place to live. Because every person deserves a safe home and a safe community. And in three years, I want Colorado to be closing in on our goal of becoming one of the top set 10 safest states in the country. Right now, Right now, Colorado falls in the middle of the pack on crime rates, but that's not good enough. We can and we must do better. And I want to commend our legislators who helped pass last year's historic public safety package, including Senator Buckner, Representative Valdez, Representative Ricks, Representative Bacon, and so many others, from investment in recruitment and retention for local law enforcement to physical communities, investment to physical improvements in our communities and our schools, uh, to support proven crime prevention strategies, this bipartisan collaboration is already beginning to have an impact. Thanks to this work, the Arapahoe County Sheriff's Office, like many others, received a grant that supports new and existing officers, helping to make their community safer for everyone. Today we're joined by Sheriff Tyler Brown, who actually came to the Capitol straight from a swearing-in ceremony for new officers who were recruited with the support from the funding that you passed last year. Join me in welcoming Sheriff Tyler Brown. The sheriff. We are also joined by Summit County Sheriff Jamie Fitzsimons, Estes Park, Chief of Police David Hayes, Pueblo Police Chief Chris Noller, Chief of Auraria Campus Police, Mike Phibbs, and Chief Matt Packard of the Colorado State Patrol, thank you for your commitment and the commitment of all of our men and women in blue for keeping our communities safe. We also celebrate the important work of community organizations who are helping kids achieve future success. Thanks to legislation passed last year with the leadership of Representative Doherty, Representative Gonzalez Gutierrez, Senator Coleman, and Senator Henriksen, Boys and Girls Clubs in Colorado received funding to launch a pilot across 21 club sites in 15 counties to provide real, meaningful enrichment opportunities outside of school to help youth reach their full potential and avoid entering the justice system. These services will reach thousands of Coloradans. Today we are joined by the 2022 Youth of the Year Award winner, Amaya Garcia, her parents, Boys and Girls Club leaders from across the state, including Casey Hedrick. Join, uh, thank you for joining us, Boys and Girls Club, and for your work. To build on this work to make Colorado safer, I'm proposing an additional package that will provide even more resources for local law enforcement and community organizations doing important work on the ground. This funding will help us crack down on auto theft with stronger tools, including technology, to help us locate and return stolen vehicles. An auto theft task force 
and greater support for district attorneys in communities with high rates of auto theft to help them successfully prosecute the criminals and hold them responsible. <laughs> Last fall, I called on the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice to get tough on auto theft sentencing. And just last week, the Commission's Sentencing Task Force moved their recommendation forward overwhelmingly. And I look forward to seeing their recommendation taken up by the General Assembly on this important topic. This is an issue that has affected some of you in this chamber and so many of our fellow Coloradans. And I look forward to finding better solutions to reduce auto theft in the state of Colorado. We're also investing in improving crime prevention strategies, expanding the capacity of the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, improving school safety by helping our schools make security improvements, expanding threat assessment, creating a one-stop shop to help schools and parents get the resources they need. I want to recognize our dedicated partner and our efforts to make Colorado safer, Attorney General Phil Weiser. Partnership with our local leaders is critical to making Colorado safer. And I want to thank Colorado Springs Mayor John Southers, Aurora Mayor Mike Coffin, Denver Mayor Michael Hancock, who's represented today by Acting Mayor Laura Aldretti, for their leadership in helping to make Colorado safer. The, these mayors of the three largest cities in our state Greeley's coming after you, but you're the three largest. Republican and Democratic have helped identify tools to successfully fight crime in their communities and others. And together, we want the state to step up and be a more constructive partner in this work. I'm proud to join their recent call, their bipartisan call for action, including greater penalties for car theft, deterring unlawful weapon possession by felons, and cracking down on ghost guns, which are completely untraceable and increasingly being used to carry out violent crimes. In the session ahead, let's take action on their recommendations and other things that we can do to continue our bipartisan work to make Colorado safer for everyone. The horrific shooting at Club Q is one of too many examples of how a crime can inflict pain and fear for an entire community. And I want to take a moment to remember those who were lost that night. Let's have a moment of silence for Daniel Aston, Kelly Loving, Ashley Paw, Derek Rump, and Raymond Green Vance. I also want to recognize the acts of heroism. And we have two heroes with us here today. These individuals were at the club that night to have fun with their friends, with their family. After the shooter entered and began firing, they brought him to the ground, they stopped them, and in doing so, they saved many, many lives. Join me in thanking Colorado hero Richard Fierro, his wife Jessica, his daughter Casey, who was injured in the shooting herself, she's back on her feet, and Colorado hero Thomas James for their incredible actions that day. Thank you on behalf of the state of Colorado.
There are hundreds of Coloradans today who don't have to mourn their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their son, their daughter because of your act of heroism at the right place at the right time. We should always strive to learn from our experiences. And as we move forward, we should consider strengthening Colorado's extreme risk protection order to prevent those who are at risk to themselves or others from getting their hands on a gun. This legislation has been used hundreds of times successfully, but we can do more to spread awareness and make sure it's used when the situation calls for it. Right now, loved ones in local law enforcement have the ability to pursue an extreme risk protection order. But why not expand this to include additional petitioners like district attorneys? I look forward to exploring common sense solutions with all of you. Together, we'll continue working to make our community safer for everyone. And four years from now, we'll all have something to celebrate in we being one of the 10 safest states in the country. James, James Baldwin said, there is never time in the future in which we will work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment. The time is always now. So I ask you again, who do we want to be when our great state reaches our 150th birthday? I want us to be a state where every person can find a home in their budget for rent or purchase, where our water resources are protected and support the needs of our communities, our farmers, and our economy. A state where we've secured 100% renewable energy by 2040 and every Coloradan can get the education and skills that they need to thrive. I want us to be one of the 10 safest states in the country. And I want healthcare and everything in our state to be more affordable for everyone. I want our state and our nation to be a beacon of hope and freedom for all, no matter your gender, your ethnicity, your age, your race, your ability, who you love or who you are, a Colorado for all. That's what Coloradans want to, and it's up to us to deliver. If we can do that, we'll have successfully secured our future for the next 150 years and be an example for the rest of the country to follow at 250. To put things in perspective, that's barely a quarter Methuselah's life on Earth of 969 years, and less than one-tenth the lifetime of Colorado's oldest 2,510-year-old bristlecone pine. But this is the future that we deserve. So let's make it happen. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated the beginning of a new year. Instead of resolutions, some people chose a single word to guide them in the year ahead. If I had to choose a word for Colorado, I'd pick limitless, because I truly believe that if we work together, what we can do is limitless. And the example that we can set for the rest of the country and the world is beyond measure. Today, in 2023, the state of our state is undeniably strong, but we know that we can be even stronger and better for our potential is truly limitless. God bless you all, God bless Colorado, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much, Governor Polis. Will the committee escort the governor from the chamber?
Majority Leader Duran. Mr. President, I move that the message from the governor be printed in the House Journal. If there is no objection to the governor's message, the governor's message will be printed in the House Journal. Senate Majority Leader Moreno. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the joint session be dissolved. Seeing no objection to Senator Moreno's motion, the joint session is dissolved.
Members, we will be calling the House back to order in just a moment. We are so grateful for our guests today. Thank you, just a moment. The House will come back to order. Members, any announcements or introductions? Representative Weissman. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, members, over the course of the morning, uh, you, like I, have probably gotten a variety of emails rescheduling certain things that were originally on the calendar for tomorrow to some future date because of the pendency of some weather. I have one more such announcement to make. Uh, at the end of last week, I announced uh, the first in a series of trainings that our nonpartisan staff will be doing. This one pertains to our judicial branch because of the weather that will not be tomorrow morning. Instead, it has been reset uh, out one week, Wednesday the 25th, 8 uh, a.m. in the Old State Library that way. Next week, not tomorrow. Be safe in the weather. Thanks. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Transportation, local government, housing, the committee with a double header this afternoon in Old State Library. Be there. Thank you. Representative Winter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just wanted to announce that tonight the Colorado Cattlemen's, so they'll have their third annual 1867 reception at the Renaissance in Denver. And just so you know, um, they come every year to talk about the issues that are going to happen in the legislative session. It's a member-driven organization that represents the interest of over 10,000 cattle ranching families throughout the state, and its focus is on the beef industry. So, you know, if you get a chance, stop by and support those that not only feed Colorado, but feed everybody in America. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Winter, one of my favorite dinners of the year. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, National Western Stock Show tonight. Tonight at 7 o'clock is Military Appreciation Night at the Pro Rodeo. So get down there if you're a military folk. Uh, they'll be treating you extra special. And uh, the rodeo is extra special just to see it in general. They got some very talented people uh, riding different uh, bulls and horses and the little kids with the sheep. It's all fun. So go and check out the rodeo tonight at 7 o'clock, Military Appreciation Night. Thank you. Representative Woodrow. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, very exciting news. This Friday, January 20th, upon adjournment, Old Supreme Court will be hearing the Smart Act hearing for the Joint State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. Be there or be somewhere else. Representative Soper and Representative Winter and Representative Taggart. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, members, tonight is the CMU, which is Colorado Mesa University Legislative Reception. It's at the Art Hotel from uh, 4 to 6 p.m. We uh, highly encourage everyone to attend, and then you can go off to the uh, Cattlemen's or to the Veterans Rodeo after that. But uh, we, we are part of the CMU caucus because we're all connected. I did my undergrad there. Yeah, Representative please, Winter. Mavs. Yeah, you nice if you attend. Go Mavs. <laughs> go Mavs. <laughs> Thank you. Representative McLaughlin and Representative Ortiz. We have some exciting news to announce. We have been given permission to be absent from the chamber. I will be gone February 2nd and 3rd. And I will be gone uh, January 19th. Yay. So approved. 
Thanks for doing that in tandem. Representative McCormick. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So guess why I'm up here? All, all of the above. Um, we are still raising funds for our young stock show presenters for Friday. Um, again, those of you old school that have checkbooks, pull out your checkbooks and write a check that has good zeros after it to NWSS Junior Livestock Sale, or just to National Western Stock Show, um, and I'm also still collecting cash. So um, I have to tell you, I know Representative Catlin is not here today. Thank you. Um, but we are behind, and I hate to have to come up here and say that, but we are behind, and we have a few days to catch up. So I'm encouraging all of you to help me catch up. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Representative Winter? No. Uh, Representative Kip. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Energy and Environment Committee members. Um, so we are scheduled to have the second phase of our Smart Act hearing tomorrow with the JBC at 8 a.m. Um, I think that is probably dependent on weather. I would assume that it will probably be in the old state, um, Sup old Supreme Court chambers an hour before we convene. However, if that changes, I will let you notice. So that means if we, for some reason, start late tomorrow because of weather, show up there an hour beforehand, and if that is not the correct thing, we will let you know. Thank you, Representative Kipp. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, I move that the House stand in recess until later today. Seeing no objection, the House will stand in recess until later today.